in just the last 24 hours, we've seen Kamala Harris be more or less nominated to be the Democratic opponent against Donald Trump and J.D. Vance in 2024. Right now, we have breaking news that shows that Kamala Harris has basically ran it up. All the money that was withheld from Joe Biden's campaign has been ostensibly been just put into the coffers of the Kamala campaign. Now, this is huge for a multitude of reasons, and this completely changes the prospects of this election. As of right now, we obviously don't have a VP yet for Kamala, but we've narrowed down the list down to a few folks, including Senator Mark Kelly of my home state of Arizona. We've got that astronaut. We've got Josh Shapiro of Pennsylvania. We also have a few others like Roy Cooper, governor of North Carolina. And so we have different factors here. We also have different issues to tackle with. In my last video, and you might think, wow, three in a row about Kamala? It might be an overdose, but when you look at it, this is like Narcan. It clarifies so much, and it helps you to understand what's going on, okay? This breaking news could not come any faster. Folks, we do have the first aggregate of the polling for Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump, and we do have every other candidate also surveyed, so this is brilliant. As of right now, we see uh, President Trump at 43.4% of support, Kamala at 42 Kennedy at 7.8. We have Jill Stein at 1.6. That's the Green Party. And then you have Cornell West 1.2. So not the cool one, but we do have Cornell West, who's a very far left kind of uh, Nutella uh, flavored uh, Bernie Sanders there. But we do have Trump up by 3.2. We even have a charting of this phenomena. As you can see prior, we didn't have Kennedy, Jill Stein and uh, Cornell West in the polling. This matters because obviously in a ton of states that matter, you have third, fourth and fifth uh, party candidates on the ballot, and these people will take votes from the Democrats. You could argue Kennedy maybe uh, could take votes from Trump, but truly, Jill Stein and Cornell West, I promise you, nobody's going uh, from Trump to those, okay? So this is very, very vital. Here, I can mathematically prove to y'all why this fundraising is really important. A lot of people might uh, take this the wrong way, and they might think, wow, it's really over for Donald Trump, even though he's leading in the polls right now, that, you know, all this money's going to Kamala. It must mean that he's poised to lose. Truth is, is that it doesn't really change the calculus. This was completely expected, and this was part of the uh, informal coup against uh, Joe Biden, basically the guy who got all the votes in the primary, 14 million exactly, basically. And so now we're dealing with a situation in where Kamala Harris Harris uh, was able, and maybe it wasn't her, maybe somebody more intelligent and competent, but basically the bigwigs at the Democratic uh, National Committee said, okay, well, let's withhold the fundraising, let's withhold all the Biden campaign funds until he quits, and then when he quits, whether or not he did it himself or somebody took over his Twitter account while he was napping the, for the fifth time today, basically what happened is that he resigned. And for all intents and purposes, the money that should have came to Biden ever since that disastrous debate performance last month, almost to the day, um, has been funneling to Kamala. And so for her to uh, raise a couple hundred million dollars in the past uh, two to three days is pretty remarkable. But also keep in mind that this is like a backstop of like a it's like if uh, you were to try to present a paycheck that goes back six weeks and then you're trying to sell it like it's like your weekly uh, pay stub and it's just a facetious thing. But either way, we do have some math to prove that I'm correct about this. So for starters, just look at these uh, factoids. So for starters, let's even assume that Kamala Harris will have more fundraising money than Donald Trump. There's a couple of different caveats, and these are very rich ones, okay? First and foremost, in 2016, Donald Trump ended up raising about $400 million for his campaign. Seems like a lot of money. You look at Hillary, who lost. She had about $667 million. So she had about 50% more money than Donald Trump ended up with, or more than that even. And she still lost. Keep this in mind. Now, this might help uh, popularize people in places like California. And so you might en end up with the Democrat winning the popular vote, like what happened in 2000. But what matters is who takes the oath of office. And so that Electoral College victory is taking precedent over the popular vote. And so advertisements might win you votes, but it depends where you spend the money and where it gets you the votes. Again, a lot of online support might be there for Kamala on the behalf of, uh, uh, what do you call it, spiting Trump. But we need to talk about where the states are getting funded, okay? The ones that matter are clearly places like North Carolina, Pennsylvania, the most important in my opinion, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, all this sort of thing. Now, moving on to a different factor, we're going to move towards 2020, a more recent result. And you can see that Donald Trump ended up raising $876 million, so double what he did the first time. 
Now, Biden, on the other hand, raised $1.16 billion, okay? And you see other sources that say that Trump was outspent by Hillary 6 to 1 and by Biden 3 to 1 or vice versa. But just using the most favorable results for the Democratic narrative, just because I'm like that, you can see that Biden ended up raising hundreds of millions of more dollars than Donald Trump. And obviously, Donald Trump came within about 50,000 votes between three states, namely Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin, from winning the election basically outright in the Electoral College. That's assuming you take the result at face value, which, I mean, anybody with a pulse nowadays can understand, you know, Biden, 81 million votes, more votes than Barack Obama. It's a tough sell, but you know what? That used car got sold, and now you're living with the baby. So now Kamala's driving it thinking, you know, we got another four years of this. But the money flowing in still probably doesn't mean that she'll win. Another factor that a lot of people won't uh, mention is that, and again, this is like very much nerd, like the video, if you're just as much of an uh, election wonk as me, because when you look at it, you'll notice that somebody like Mitt Romney actually raised another $100 million over what Trump did. In fact, he got like $200 more million than Trump did in 2016, and he ended up losing to Obama, whereas Trump actually beat Hillary, despite Hillary making more fundraising uh, milestones than did Romney in 2012. And so just keep this in mind, okay? So bang for your buck. And that's ironic giving the assassination attempt. But the point being is that bang for your buck, Trump is definitely making the most out of fundraising. And here's the other caveat. Donald Trump, if you've paid attention, has not really been spending the campaign money. He's been hoarding it. And you might say, well, isn't he selfish? Is he embezzling it? No. He's waiting because for a while there was a limbo and there's memos that have gone out there that have said that, in fact, uh, the Trump people have been more or less been since a couple weeks before the debate even happened last month, since May, really. They've been anticipating, OK, you know, what if Joe actually drops out, if not the presidency, at least for reelection? OK, so they kind of had to hold a couple a couple of arrows in the quiver this entire time because they've been anticipating that Kamala or God forbid somebody else became the nominee, that all of a sudden all this money spent on uh, basically targeting Joe Biden would all of a sudden go uh, to waste. And so they've been holding on to more money than you'd expect. Now we're seeing a flurry of anti-Kamala ads because obviously Kamala is the presumptive nominee, and now she's going to be hit way harder. You know, any sort of uh, attacks that Kamala has sustained the past three and a half years have been just because she was standing next to Joe. It was more like a drive-by situation. It wasn't intentional to get her. But now she's going to be tagged by a sniper team of, uh, of ads to character assassinate Kamala because now she is uh, totally withholding to her baggage as a candidate. So now we ta now that we've tackled that fundraising uh, situation, let's get more into the prediction at hand. We do have polls that we have to consult. You know, in the span of 24 hours, given the craziness of, the, of this election cycle, actually is ample time for an update on these latest polls. So we've already consulted the aggregate. You have an idea as to what's going on here. But we do have some other uh, scenarios. Now, we have covered the five-way election with uh, Kennedy, uh, Jill Stein, and Cornell West. Now, if we do a 1v1 against Kamala with Trump, obviously that's not going to happen. It's going to be better for Donald Trump if he has the other people on the ballot, and he will in a lot of situations. But just giving Kamala a fighter's chance here, she can get her claws out and look at a 1.6 popular vote lead for Donald Trump. Why is this important? Well, Donald Trump actually ended up getting about 46% of the vote in 2020, and he very narrowly lost the Electoral College according to the official count, which we all totally believe happened. Anyhow, uh, you know, if Trump actually ended up doing a percent better like he is in this aggregate, even if it's disfavorable to what I believe is going to happen, it still shows that Trump would have won places like Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, et cetera, probably Pennsylvania in that case, in which case then all of a sudden he'd be reelected in 2020. So you could see how disfavorable this really is for Kamala when you parse through the veneer here. No, this is where I have to input a little bit of expert opinion. When you look at latest polls, it's not enough, and it doesn't suffice it, to just point out to what happened in the past day and say, oh, this Ipsos Reuters response poll is accurate. That shows that Harris is up by even two, three, and four. Obviously, these don't even line up. If these are all virtually the same poll, how are they 4% different? For you know, for there to be a variance of four, it means that there's no credibility to the poll right here because what the hell is going on? Also, namely, let me tell you what, when it comes down to it, again, the poll that has uh, Trump losing by four, you see it, and the, the vote in and of itself only adds up 
to about 88% of the total vote. So what, is Jill Stein going to have 10% or something? No, the answer is is that there's 12% just undecided. Undecideds will namely probably go to Donald Trump, as they have been this entire election cycle. And obviously, Biden had to win the undecided vote in 2020 by about 10% to even get close to winning in the first place. So these I don't really believe. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the most favorable Kamala poll to see what the math is as to what could happen on the contrary. Because, again, it might seem like a basic solution to say, well, you know, Trump's winning anyway, so let's just fill it out the way that I have done the past several times. But let's add in a little bit of a devil's advocate, okay? So Kamala's advocate here, ironic given she was a prosecutor, but let's play defense attorney for the Harris campaign. So apparently a Marist uh, NPR poll just released – conducted uh, post-Biden withdrawal Monday, so I think that was yesterday, uh, Trump up by, let's say, 46% to Harris is 45. In a broader field, Harris and Trump are tied to 42, so that's with all the other people on the ballot. Harris's favorability is 40 to uh, negative 44, so she's down four on average. Trump's favorability is down six on average. 87% of people say that Biden made the right decision by stepping down re-election-wise. And so I think a lot of other YouTubers would use this one off to say like, oh, wow, Trump is more hated than Kamala. Wow, Kamala, bros, we're so back. Oh, we have this $100 million figure and we have this rally going on. Truth is, though, when you look into it, uh, D plus six on party identification plus a 44% college educated plus uh, result. And so that's the thing. You know, these people will sell you a poll where Kamala is losing by one instead of the usual, let's say, four percent. And then all of a sudden you realize that they sampled six percent more Democrats than Republicans. What the hell is up with that? And again, college grads are skewing anti Trump because that's just been what's been happening the past about 10 years. Now, we have a good point by Radical Politics, who's been a nerd about this subject longer than I have. He says, actually, Trump leading in this disfavorable poll by only one is actually pretty good, given that Harris was leading the last poll by one. So that's a two-point improvement. Namely, it's better that way, because when you realize it, that this is a Democrat plus six poll by the bones of it, then obviously it's going to be biased towards the left, and Trump is still winning it. And beyond this, obviously, if after the announcement of Biden resigning, that in and of itself shows that when people put their attention to Harris, they start liking her less on paper. Do you want somebody – like, you know, if you ask uh, middle America uh, Democrats, okay, can you have somebody other than Biden? They'll say, yeah, of course, but then it's, like, worse. So it's like going from, like, your ex-girlfriend to someone less attractive. I mean, you on paper want to say let's upgrade, but the upgrade turns out to be faulty. I mean, you're going from, like, an iPhone 15 to a 6S. It's really bad. So right before we actually get to the – prediction in and of itself let's go ahead and just quickly check on how popular the candidates are respectively we have kamala harris at a negative 13.6 percent disapproval rating so what that basically means is that an outright majority of americans polled are actively disliking kamala and this is prior to her uh, obviously being seen on the world stage by everybody and so what that opens you up to is whether or not you are likable you might go up in the favorability or if you're cackling dislikable plus obviously trump has withheld the money on destroying kamala until this moment and so we're going to really see the real results in several days from today but just to preempt what's going on so just imagining just right off the bat you know you give democrats and middle americans in the middle okay Biden people thought, you know, okay, this, this guy's going to lose. But the answer is Kamala in this case, presumptively. Okay, now she as like I said, she's at a 13.6 negative rating. As everybody with eyes can see, Donald Trump as a is at a negative 11.2%. So he's 2.2% or 2.4% better off than Kamala. Interesting, obviously, because virtually any politician historically is less hateable than Trump with the caveat of maybe Hillary. But even in 2020, people saw, OK, Uncle Joe, you're kind of old, you're kind of lame, but OK, you're the white bread. That's almost inevitable. But, you know, maybe you'll touch it. But the point being is when it comes down to Donald Trump, though, he was always seen as like, you know, obviously half the country will hate him, half will love him. These things have been ameliorated, though, with the assassination attempt and the very obviously cool uh, response to it. And so with that being said, uh, his disfavorability has narrowed down a little bit. Now, people will still hate him for no good reason, a lot would say. But regardless of that fact, we do have him pulling better than Kamala as of right this second by about 2.5 percent on average. So he's still disliked, but not as much as usual. Keep in mind, in 2020, Joe Biden won with 3% positive approval. What that means is that he basically had a tested endorsement of like most people that obviously everybody who voted for him, but even some of the people who didn't vote for Joe thought, okay, he's, on, he's, an, he's, you know, he's an all right guy. 
now Kamala, it's, you know, the people that vote for you, but nobody outside of that. And same thing with Trump, but to a lesser degree, obviously. And so we're looking at this through a vector of Kamala being less popular than Trump or at least at par at best for her. And so this whole argument of like we need uh, sanity in the White House, but it's like, well, if the American people at the ballot box disagree with you, then uh, God forbid you're wrong. And so we're going to go ahead and with this prediction. So obviously we see that uh, Trump, I would say, leads Harris by an average of 3%. Uh, we saw the five-way result is different from the 1v1. This is more accurate, obviously. So as of right now, Trump is leading by about 3 um, with that being said, what we need to do here is ostensibly take the 2020 result and then add seven points to the Republicans, much like what we did in the last video. Just obviously now we have a whole litany of context as to why this might be the case. So, for example, the basic heuristic you want to do in this election prognosis is to say, OK, well, Kamala, you know, now that she doesn't have uh, you don't have a candidate who's demented, you can totally get into the frame of mind of, OK, if I hate Trump or I'm a died in the cast, you know, blue Democrat, OK, you're going to vote whoever the nominee is for president. And so Kamala, dislikable, however she may be, she's guaranteed that 42 percent. You know, the vote that McCain got in 2008, you know, objectively, Obama was a good candidate and whatever have you. But, you know, McCain still put up a fight, I guess. Point being is that, you know, you're basically guaranteed as a major party nominee over 40 percent of the vote unless the third party is massive. And RFK, much like his voice, doesn't project much onto the national stage. And so we're really only focusing on 1v1 ostensibly. So right now, we do have the states that are really solid Democrat as of the past several years to be still in that column, including Colorado, including New Mexico, including Virginia, including Minnesota. That includes maybe New Hampshire, but we're tepid about that at best. I think the VP nomination might be vital towards places like Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and namely New Hampshire. The reason being is that Kamala is seen as somewhat to the left of the normal mainstream Democrats. Biden was literally like the dead center of like, OK, this is like the most congenial, you know, he's been around for decades. He's not crazy. Kamala goes a little different when it comes to public perception. And so that's an important thing to note. That being said, like I like I was pointing to earlier to have that 40 ish percent of the vote behind you solidified instead of Biden, that guarantees that the deep blue states will stay the way they are. And you can see it now on the map. That being said, I do think that assuming she doesn't pick Roy Cooper, because, again, we don't know who the VP is yet, and Vance obviously doesn't matter electorally, you'll notice all of a sudden that North Carolina is pretty much solidified. You'll see that Georgia's back in the Republican column, as is Arizona. Nevada is a flip for the first time, and I think two, I think 2004 might have been the last time I voted Republican. Now, we do have some results that are kind of difficult to parse through. It might be that Kamala could win Maine, not that she's really – really popular in Maine or anything, but uh, the way it works is that obviously it went really blue in 2020, so it would take a whole lot of uh, you know, luck basically for Trump to pull that out. Um, Nebraska might be more favorable than I thought prior uh, because Kamala doesn't have the suburban kind of like posh white upper middle class appeal that I think that Biden has. But that being said, it's also a difficult thing to understand because, again, Nebraska's second district is so irrelevant in the grand scheme of things that it doesn't really even matter. But it's 269 to 221. It goes down to who wins any of these last four states. So let's get right into the math. New Hampshire is difficult to tell. I'm going to leave that blue for now because it went really blue in 2020. Again, Kamala doesn't have as good of appeal to that sector in New Hampshire and New England in general as did Biden. That being said, I don't think it really matters. And plus, when it comes down to it, if she picks a white guy that's liberal in disposition, like Pete Buttigieg, I think he would do great in New Hampshire, which kind of tells you what kind of clientele you're working with there as a politician. But anyhow, we do have three last states that are really important. Namely, we have Pennsylvania. Michigan and Wisconsin, if she picks a VP from any of these states, it could totally uh, temper the result and you might see it a lot closer than what I think will happen. Clearly, we do have, uh, I would say, uh, Pennsylvania is the more conservative of these three politically, just that obviously um, if she picks Shapiro, Governor Shapiro is more popular than the average Democrat. And so that might sway the vote a little bit. But assuming that's not a factor, then we have Trump Vance winning this. Uh, same thing with the Wisconsin and then Michigan in that order. Um, it's difficult to see which one of these are the most liberal and the least likely to flip back to the GOP. But truth is, is that obviously if Trump is winning the popular vote, he's he's going to win the swing states. It, it then becomes a question of if he wins Minnesota, flips New Hampshire, etc. 
But as for places like uh, New Jersey or Virginia or Colorado, places that you might have thought could have flipped back then, or even, you know, some people were talking about a red New York, that's pretty much bygone. You know, we have a politicized sort of politique that makes it so that we have to deal with uh, somewhat close elections, even if obviously Kamala is a super unlikable person, super unqualified, the DEI candidate, basically, you know, they talk about affirmative action. This is like a step beyond that. You know, you have people who might have benefited from affirmative action, but are smart. She not only benefited from these things, but also is a midwit at best. And so it's a question of like, is, is your maid at the house more uh, politically competent than Kamala? And that's a very vigorous debate that one could have. And so I think she is poised to lose. Um, we're going to make another video soon on who the VP could be. That might sway the results a little bit. It might help Kamala's odds by maybe anywhere from 5 to 15% because it's a very crazy scenario. And so some sense of stability might be important. So you might want to pick a more centrist person like Andy Bashir. But we'll see the bona fide, sorry, the bona fides of Kamala show uh, a streak of progressive politics, but also obviously a woman that reeks of opportunism and reeks of whatever came out of Willie Brown's, you know what, uh, many decades ago. But I'll leave you with that. So comment down below if you like the video. Like the video. If you liked it, obviously, because that is what boosts it in the algorithm, and I'll love you for it. See you in the next one. Adios.